Hello, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us today for another installment of Exploring Our World, where we here at Colonial Williamsburg dive into the minds and experiences of daily life in the 18th century. In observation of Mental Health Awareness Month, today we're going to be talking about Williamsburg's public hospital and mental health in the 18th century. I'm Stacey Loveland, and joining me today are Jan Gillum and Christina Westenberger from the Art Museums of Colonial Williamsburg. Thank you both so much for joining us today. Oh, for having, us. For having us. Excited great. to have you here. Yay. Um, in order to get started, let's just begin by having each of you tell us a bit about who you are and what you do here with Colonial Williamsburg. Okay. I am Jan Gillum, and I'm manager of exhibit planning at the art museums. And I've been at Colonial Williamsburg for almost 30 years. And one of the things I love about it is that I get to research so many different topics. And one of those has been the public hospital, particularly since um, up until recently, it's been the entrance to the art museums. So I've been in it every day. And I thought I'd better learn a little bit more about it. Wonderful. I'm happy you're here with us. Good. <laughs> Hi, I'm Christina Westenberger. I'm the manager of gallery learning. So tours and activities that play, take place in the galleries at the art museums fall under uh, me. And um, I, like Jan, enjoy the opportunity to learn about different things. We don't have to concentrate on one particular subject in the 18th century. We get to really, really explore. And the public hospital has become really, really important to me. And um, I'm excited to tell this story. Hey, well, I'm very excited for this conversation today, and we're looking forward to answering all of your questions. So for anyone who's watching and listening at home, if there's anything you're wondering about, please post those questions in the comments. We're going to try and answer as many as we can. But to get us started off properly, let's just give everyone some background about the public mm -hmm. hospital, because this is not a regular hospital at all, is it? Not the way that we might think of a hospital. <laughs> And I think it's always interesting to take a look at, at that word hospital and see kind of where the base meaning comes from. And if you go back in time, hospital uh, was used to describe hostel or guest house or place of lodging. As we move into the Middle Ages, it becomes a place to care for people who didn't have a place to go to. And finally, by the 1500s, it becomes institution for sick or wounded people. So when we use the term public hospital here in Williamsburg in the 18th century, we're using it as a place for those suffering mental illness. And we have the first hospital here in British North America built specifically for the purpose to care for people suffering mental illness in the 18th century. And that's incredible. Mm -hmm. uh, how did that come to be established? I mean, if this is the first of its kind, who has the idea? Who gets it started? Well, there was a governor, a lieutenant governor here in the colony of Virginia. He was acting on behalf of, of the king. His name was Francis Fauquier. And he's here in the 1750s and 60s. And in November of 1766, he sends the House of Burgesses this welcome letter to get back to business. And the first part of that, that message is, we should be very happy and uh, excited that Parliament has repealed the Stamp Act. And in the end of that letter, he very specifically talks about um, providing a place for those who need care and maintenance to be attended by Abel's physicians to endeavor to restore them to lost reason. And he's talking about people who have suffered a loss of reason or those suffering from mental illness. And he specifically says that other countries have hospitals of this kind and we should follow, we should follow that path. Um, and, and so that's, that's where it gets started in 1766. Yeah, that's incredible. <laughs> uh, now, when we look at the hospital itself, there are some very interesting aspects about the building that would be a bit hard to describe here, I think, mm -hmm. without some visuals. Uh, the building we have today is actually reconstructed on top of the original foundations right. of the 1773 right. public hospital. And we have a short video that you put together oh. for us uh, to show the location of the building today and how it was laid out mm -hmm. historically. Yes. When the House of Burgesses put forth the Act of 1770 to build a public hospital, they very specifically stated that they wanted a piece of property that was no bigger than four acres 
uh, outside of town, or on the edge of town. So they didn't want to build it right in the center of the city. It is different from the rest of the public buildings in town because when you stand on Francis Street, and that's the street right outside the front door of the public hospital, the building is set far away from the street. And if you look at the Frenchman's map, which is a map that was drawn during the American Revolution, and you look at the lot that the public hospital sits on, the building sits at the very back of the property. And you can't help but infer from that that the, the House of Burgesses, um, those people making the decisions about the building of the property, wanted to make it very clear that this was not a place for everybody to come and visit. So for me personally, when I look at the building standing on Francis Street, looking down that path to the public hospital, it appears to be much farther away from me than it actually is. I don't think it appears that far away from inside the building. Like when you're looking out the window, you're like, oh, Francis Street is right there. But when you're standing on Francis Street, the building looks so much further away. Again, that's a personal, a personal view. That's kind of how I've looked at the building, but that's, that's interesting to consider. When you walk in the front doors, you end up in a lobby termed a stair hall in the 18th century. That's where uh, the patients would arrive, uh, either brought by friends or family members or brought by their local sheriff in its waiting room of sorts. Across the hall from that entry lobby was an apartment for the keeper, and the keeper was the man hired to oversee the operations of the public hospital. Once that patient arrived, they would be taken to the second floor of the building, which was laid out the same as the first floor. There's a stair hall and a large room, but the large room on the second floor was for the directors of the hospital, men appointed by the House of Burgesses to oversee the administration of the building. And it was in that room that the patient was questioned and it was determined whether or not they should be admitted or not. So from that room, the patient would then be taken to a cell, a room specifically for one person. And, and that's how this building was designed in the 18th century. Each patient was assigned their own room. And in that room, they were seen by a doctor, they were cared for by the keeper or the matron if, if they were a female patient. Um, there were enslaved Africans who were hired as day laborers who worked with the keeper and the matron. So they're visiting patients in their cell. They, they were fed in their cell. Treatments took place in their cell. Um, on the, the lower level of the building or the basement level, there was a laundry, a kitchen, and a storage room. So think about that. There are 12 cells on each floor, 24 cells a room for the board of directors, a keeper's apartment, a laundry, a storage room, and hallways and passages. What's missing from this building? That would be something to think about. There's no doctor's office. There's no cafeteria. There's no recreation room. Uh, there's no dispensary. There's no nurse's station. There's, there's laundry facilities, but those are located far away from the patients. Well, thank you so much for that look inside both our modern and 18th century public hospital. Mm -hmm. uh, for all of you watching at home, please feel free to keep on sending in those questions. We're going to be answering them, but I have one that I want to ask to get us started off. Sure. Having seen you know, the setup of the hospital, right. heard the overview about it, what is a typical day actually like inside the public hospital in the 18th century? That is a great question. And when it comes to a typical day at the public hospital here in Williamsburg, we don't know um, because that information doesn't survive. We have little bits of information that, that help us kind of fill in the blanks. But for, for me, when I can't find something that I'm looking for, I tend to go to St. Luke's Hospital in London, seems to be organized and run in, in a similar manner. And the way that their day works there is you have this staff of people who work there. There's a keeper and a matron at our public hospital here in Williamsburg. 
and the Act of 1770, which the House of Burgesses put into place, say that they'll specifically hire a keeper and a matron, as well as nurses and guards. And we think that's where um, these enslaved individuals uh, pop up in, in, um, in uh, those account books. There were three names that pop up specifically. Three men, Lancaster, Jack, and Sam. So you've got this staff who's working there. So patients would arise in the morning, they would be bathed and dressed appropriately and then be given breakfast. And Dr. John De Sequera, who was an attending physician at the hospital, he writes out the menu for the day. So I was interested to learn that they were served either mush or gruel with bread and butter and milk for breakfast. And then after breakfast, Again, back at St. Luke's Hospital in London, that's when the treatments began. So the doctor came, put together a plan for each patient, but it's the keeper, the matron, and those, those uh, enslaved men who are working at the hospital who are following through with that daily plan. And treatments could be medicinal treatments or um, bathing treatments seem to be very popular in the 18th century, specifically bathing in very cold water. That would be your morning. And then around dinner time, you would have dinner, which again, Dr. Seguera <laughs> says that four days a week you could have fresh meat, three days a week you could have a half a pound of bacon, um, occasionally broth or vegetables or small beer, and then the rest of the week you could either have rice or mush or pottage, with butter and cheese, and uh, for supper, anything, anything left over for breakfast. But between that dinner and supper time, again, continuing with treatments, or the patients would be in their cell. Yeah. All of this taking place in their individual room. So they're not spending much time out and about unless they have the opportunity to go outside accompanied by the keeper, the matron, or one of these guards or, or nurses, depending on how you look at that job. And then at nighttime, my question is, there was that keeper's apartment. Did the keeper and the matron, who were married, James and Mary Galt, did they stay in the hospital? Or did they lock the door and go home? And we don't know. And, and that's something that pops up at St. Luke's, it seems. The keeper there um, locks the door and goes home for the evening and comes back the next morning and, and opens, opens up for the day. Wow. <laughs> so... Primary sources are great, but when we don't have what we need here, we tend to look in, in other places. That's, that's fascinating that you're able to put so much of that together, together, though, gives a very good picture of it. Uh, so you mentioned people being in their individual cells. Mm -hmm. Are they in there the entire time? It, um, it seems to be for the most part that they are. When they established each of the cells, when they were building the public hospital, they also ordered um, iron grates for the windows so that there was no way of them breaking the windows or getting out and the doors, each cell had a door that was lockable. Um, and it wasn't until a little bit later into um, the end of the 18th century that they do build fencing around an area that they, is an exercise yard is mm -hmm. what they say, but a way for the patients to get out and get the fresh air. And so they, they are allowed a little bit more freedom because the, the, the space is confined enough that they can go out and get some fresh air. So that loosens it up a little bit. Okay. Wow. A little different then. Yeah. <laughs> Today, right. but interesting very much yeah. for the time, certainly. Yeah. Um, so when it comes to the actual people who are there, who are receiving mm -hmm. these treatments, who, who are living in these spaces, how do they decide who's actually there? What are the requirements for admittance from the board of directors? That's a great question, and I think it's something that's very similar to us today in the 21st century. So if you have somebody in your neighborhood today or in the 18th century who's acting in a way in which might not necessarily fit the norms of society, you might call your sheriff today. In the 18th century, it was the same, same thing. A sheriff would be called, and that potential patient would be taken before three local magistrates. And the public hospital was built to serve the entire colony of Virginia. Right. So it could, be, it could be a county like New Kent County or Charles City County, not just people who live here in Williamsburg. And those magistrates would question the potential patient and take notes 
And if they determined that that person might be a good candidate to come here to the public hospital, they would send those notes along with the sheriff, and the sheriff would bring that patient here to Williamsburg. Once they arrived, they would go to the front door of the public hospital and take it upstairs and meet with the court of directors who would again question. But I think it's interesting to consider the court of directors, the group of men who are administrating the hospital, in the first year, there isn't a single doctor among them. And by 1774, Dr. John de Sequera, who was the attending physician, he's on the board, but he's only one person on that court of directors helping make those decisions as to whether a patient should be admitted or not. And then they would be, that they would be admitted or they would be returned to their county. The public hospital very specifically would only accept patients that were either a danger to the rest of society or a patient they believed that they could cure. So there, there you know, were options in, in terms of, of those patients. Right. That's really helpful to know when looking at mm -hmm. how the rest of it operates. Right. And the board of directors was made up of um, many of the wealthy people in Williamsburg, like Peyton Randolph, um, who was head of the House of Burgesses, or Thomas Everard, who lived uh, one house down from the governor's palace. So these are people who are very much involved with the whole town and very well known. And these are the kind of people that are making these decisions. Interesting. Now, uh, mentioning wealthy people being involved in this, we have some great questions coming in. And uh, Doug has asked a phenomenal question. Uh, we talk about wealthy people being involved uh, heavily. Mm -hmm. What about everyone else? And very specifically, Doug is asking, uh, what about enslaved individuals? Do we know if who was patients are only free people, only white people? Are there enslaved individuals, free blacks who are able to be treated at the public hospital? And uh, if the answer to any of those groups is no, what are their options? Sure. Right. So at, at the public hospital, um, anyone white or black, as long as they're free, could be a patient there. And one of the earliest patients admitted was a woman named Charity who was a free black in town. Okay. And she pops up in Dr. John Minson Galt, who was another tending physician. It's confusing. You've got James Galt, who's the keeper, and John Minson Galt, who's a doctor in town, um, brothers. And uh, he, she pops up in his, uh, his records right. in, in terms of treatment. Um, but if you couldn't afford care, you could go to the public hospital. Right. And again, if you're suffering mental illness and more often than not, you're being brought by a friend or a family member or your local sheriff. Um, the House of Burgesses stipulated in that act of 1770 where they outlined how the public hospital was going to work and operate that they would um, set aside 25 pounds wow. per patient per year. And um, that's, that's where that care would take place. Now, if you're enslaved and you were suffering mental illness, then you would be cared for on the property in which you lived. Right. And prior to the opening of the hospital in 1773, that, that was one of the options available to anyone. And, and you could be cared for at home or you could be cared for by your local parish. Uh, perhaps you went to a workhouse here in Virginia by 1755. Workhouses were open. If you were a danger to society, you may be taken to the public jail. Or homelessness, unfortunately, was an option, much, right. much like mental illness today. And it wasn't until, I think it's about the 1830s, that they do have a place for enslaved individuals. I think they start allowing that. And then, oh. and then that goes away by the 1840s. Right, no, it, it, and, it, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, right. there's a point at which they do, and then that doesn't always work. It kind of come, wow. it, it yeah. comes and goes, right. right. That's fascinating to look yeah. at. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, we have a couple people who are very interested in some of uh, the terms we're using. Very specifically, the word cell is jumping out oh, to okay. some of our listeners' sure. ears. Uh, Lynn is asking, you know, she says it's disturbing to know that the residence rooms are being called cells. Mm -hmm. Are these people patients or are they more like inmates? Uh, and then Janet is also asking about, you know, the word cell being used, pointing out that sometimes uh, cells are how we refer to bedrooms in monasteries. So is oh. this just something that means something different in the 18th century or are these individuals being viewed differently once they're placed in the hospital? 
I, it is not, cons it, well, let's see. In the jail, you have jail cells, and that is something where they're definitely confined for a reason. The cells, and I think you're right, it's, it's more on the terms of the monastery. It's a private space where this one individual is going to be. And um, because of the understanding of levels of who these people are, they have the locks on the doors um, in protection for themselves, the patient themselves, as well as others again. Okay. And it is disturbing. I it will, is. Oh, I, I, I agree. agree. That, I and they agree are very that. sparse, but, um, you know, a mattress and a chamber pot and some other things, and that, that is their cell. Which, if, if I can also add in, there, there were bars on the windows. Right. And there um, is a record from one of the local prominent blacksmiths where by the 1780s, leg irons and chains are in use. Mm -hmm. um, by the end of the 18th century, they're creating three cells in the basement of the public hospital specifically to house um, patients who who were a bit more violent than, yes, some, of, than some of the other patients that were at the public hospital. Mm -hmm. So you're right, it's, it's not, unfortunately for us, looking back, it's really easy right. to judge, but if you go back and take a look at mental health care in the 1940s, 50s, 1960s, it's, okay. it's not much better. People trying to do what's best based on what they right. know at the what time. Based right. on what we right. know at We're the time. We're fortunate to <laughs> right. constantly right. keep advancing. Yes. Right, and I think that's why this conversation is, is so important because right. we do want to constantly advance how we're caring, yeah. caring for, for those suffering mental illness. For sure. Now, talking about individuals who might be a danger to themselves or others, and people who might be restrained, as you mentioned, uh, we have some questions coming in about that. Sarah Lynn wants to know more specifically what's happening to help the people who are a danger to themselves? Is it just those restraints? Is there anything else that we see, you know, maybe a little more comfortable <laughs> than leg irons? Well, I think that's when you get into treatments okay. and that's mm -hmm. when you find medicinals being used. And, and I'll be very open about the fact that I am not comfortable talking about medicine. That's where our apothecaries here at Colonial Williamsburg come into play. And y'all are more than welcome to come visit us in <laughs> person, visit our apothecary. Definitely. And we did do a live stream with them a little bit yeah. ago. Right, as well, right. And I would, so. <laughs> I would highly recommend going on and watching that live stream. But when you start to, to note what medicinals are being used to treat patients, things like opium and laudanum, mm -hmm then you can see where that's going to provide an opportunity to make that patient more comfortable. But then that raises the question at, at what cost right. is, yeah. is, is that medicinal being used? Right. Very, <laughs> mm -hmm. very good point. Uh, Ashley had actually asked about treatment. So as you said, opium and laudanum are some of them, but uh, do we know any other treatments that are being used, not just medicinally, but I, I, you kind of hinted at baths. Are we seeing any bleedings or anything like that? And on top of that, you know, assuming these work, how long are people staying? How long are they being treated before they leave? That's a great question. And I found this really interesting bit from 1786 that talks about from the first day of 1786 in November to the 30th day of October last, so to 1787, um, a review of the, the lunatic hospital in the city of Williamsburg. There were 36 patients of whom three have been taken out by their friend, eight have been discharged, one has escaped, nine have died, and 15 remaining on the said 30th day of October last. So in terms of patients and how long they stay, some patients stay longer than others um, prior to the 18th. Uh, 1800s, there are never more than 15 people at the public hospital at any given time. Um, and I would like to know more about patients being released or cured, and then how often do they return or do they return? Do they? Yeah. I think that's interesting. And I think um, it's interesting, the House of Burgesses, back to the, to the Burgesses, because they, they lay everything out so neatly. Um, you could be at the public hospital and then be released to friends, but they did not stipulate that you could be released to family members. And I just, that's, that's an interesting, 
that's an interesting yeah. view in terms of care. That's fascinating. Yeah. Uh, we have a lot of fantastic questions oh, that are coming in. I'm trying to read them all very quickly. Uh, but we have a lot of people wondering more about um, the individuals actually in the hospital uh, and what they are being treated specifically for. So you know, we know people are being released. And mm -hmm. I know uh, we talked about this before going right. live today. Uh, we talked about the difficulty in mm -hmm. uh, diagnosing, diagnosing things in the right. past. Uh, I'm sure those of you watching have heard that psychiatrists today aren't going to give diagnoses to you know famous people right. they need to meet with someone <laughs> before right. they can make that uh, the same kind of works for us that right. we can't right. confidently say no idea so and so had x y or z no. um but can you speak a little bit to what is being treated how they're classifying mental illness in the 18th century sure so you know, prior to kind of the mid 18th century, so pre 1750s back into the 1600s and, and then certainly going back even further than that, obviously mental illness is apparent, but the way that we view mental illness was different. So by the time we hit the middle of the 18th century, you've got all of these practitioners in England, but also in Europe who are really trying to figure out how how the person is affected by mental illness and how mental illness um, strikes an individual, for lack of a better word. And every single one of them kind of has a different reasoning or approach um, as to why. So that brings us to diagnoses. And in, in, in the basic diagnoses, by the time we get to the middle of the 18th century, you're either diagnosed with melancholia, so you're depressed, or you're, you're diagnosed with mania, you're manic. And it's, it's really either one or the other. So today, we have all of these diagnoses that kind of fit in a variety of different, different categories. And you know that's why our mental health care professionals are, are just working so hard to review each and every individual. Right. And I think in the 18th century, those doctors who are attending those patients are working really hard trying to figure out and how to best treat. Right. Because when you look at their record books, every patient is being treated differently. So there isn't a, a, a catch-all diagnosis. There isn't one particular medicine that they're using for every patient. Right. They're really looking at, at each patient individually. And they're really tr starting to figure out kind of all of these subcategories of melancholia and mania but I don't know that that information is arriving here to Virginia yet. These are conversations that are taking place back in England. Dr. Sequera is trying really hard to create kind of his own, every man his own doctor, and uh, write his own version of, of how to care for a variety of different illnesses. And he includes mania in that list of illnesses in the, in the 18th century but that's the only one that, that he notes. Um, Dr. Galt, in his records, Dr. John Minson Galt, again, attending physician in the late 18th century, he doesn't even mention mania or melancholia. So I think as we move into the 19th century, that's when you start to see various diagnoses popping up. Not that they're not there yet, okay. but at this hospital, they're just not using those words yet. So that is that is a hard one. I you know that is that is something that that we're really interested in, and we just haven't found that information right. yet. Yeah, that that is hard when you yeah. want to use right. those modern words right. to describe right. things, but you can't say can't. it for certain. Um, and the next question might be a little <laughs> again too too modern specific to sure. answer, but I'm fascinated by it. Uh, Diana is asking about people with disabilities who might have been placed in the public hospital. I mean, I know we're talking about pretty much just mania or melancholia mm -hmm. as the two main mm -hmm. categories we're looking at, but have you seen anything pop up that might indicate uh, that someone with a disability was being placed in the public hospital for treatment or help? I, I don't. No, I, I don't either. If you're, if you're suffering a disability, um, for instance, a developmental disability, chances are you're gonna be cared for at home. Oh, um, 
the, the law did differentiate between developmental disabilities yes. and mental illness. Mm -hmm. There's definitely a differentiation. Yes. And we know that those who, are, who, are, who have de developmental disabilities, more often than not, were given a guardian if they didn't have a friend or a family member um, who would administrate their estate and make sure that, that they were well looked yeah. after within the society. So I, I think that's kind yeah, of an I interesting agree. thing to consider. They also stipulated that drunkenness was not an option for a patient at the public hospital. So there's, there's, another, yeah. there's another thing to consider. Yeah. That's fascinating. Um, talking about people being cared for at home versus at the public hospital, obviously, this is the first <laughs> public hospital for mental health treatment in uh, British North America. Uh, so before it existed, people had to do something. And even after it's created, people are using home treatments and things. And one of the very famous names that tends to come up is the Henry family. And we've gotten a couple questions coming in about uh, Patrick Henry caring for his, his wife, wife. Mm -hmm. at home. Uh, and uh, Diana has written in saying that uh, they've heard that he didn't want to send his wife mm -hmm. to the Williamsburg Public Hospital. So um, would you be willing to speak a little bit more to, I think, some of the sure. myths yeah. surrounding that? The, he wouldn't send her to the hospital for a number of reasons and the various things surrounding his treatment of her at home. Was she locked in the cellar? Was she comfortable? All of that. <laughs> I will say, I, you know, that's, that's an interesting question because that's, that's a question certainly that when we give tours in the public hospital, we get quite frequently. So let's, let's winkle this out. Patrick Henry lives, what, three days journey from Williamsburg. So if he were to admit his wife, Sarah, that means he's three days journey away from his wife. His children are three days journey away from their mother. Friends and family members, three days journey away from Sarah. And if Sarah were kept at the public hospital, even if they wanted to come and visit, they would not be allowed. Because the goal for treatment, and this goes back to the question about the cells, a patient is put into an individual cell because there's this belief if you're suffering mental illness, the goal is we'll put you in a cell will remove you from the part of society that made you mentally ill, and then you will choose to get better. But that means no one can visit. So Patrick Henry, I, I can't help but think, why, why would he bring her here when all of a sudden she would be completely taken away from those friends and family members who I imagine aid, aid in her care? And that's something we just don't know about because that is not written down. Um, did he lock her in the basement? I think, from my understanding, he kept her in a room on the first floor of their house. You can call it a cellar or a basement, you can call it whatever you want, it's, it's first floor of the house. Yeah. Um, and she was uh, assigned uh, an enslaved member of their household and um, had furnishings. I, I do know that one thing that, that does survive is that there was a straight gown made for her. So think straight jacket in 18th century gown terms. Um, but, I, but I think when you look at the other options, what were the other options for Sarah? He's not gonna let her be homeless. He's not gonna bound her out and send her to live to, with another member of the parish. Um, he didn't wanna send her here. He's not gonna put her in jail. So of course, home, home health care is the best option. And then there's the question going back to that act of 1770, they didn't accept patients that they didn't believe they could cure. And maybe there was she just a accepted. belief that she is not gonna get better anyway. So we're gonna, we're gonna right. keep her at home and care for her at home in the best possible way we can. And I think there's a lot of mythology surrounding, surrounding Sarah and, and that's, that's unfortunate because she's a woman suffering mental illness. Right. Yeah. Sure, being connected to such a famous, famous revolutionary person is, names yes, brings exactly. her to the forefront. Yeah. Um, but we do know, you know, there are a lot of other individuals who sometimes slip through the gaps, whether in the historical record as a whole or just right. Right. You know, as public knowledge. Uh, but we have some people writing in and asking about the everyone else that we're encountering. Mm -hmm. So um, Tina is asking specifically if we have any records that document the identities and treatments of the patients 
that did make it to Williamsburg. And kind of going along with that, Natalie wants to know uh, if we know about ages for individuals who are being admitted. Is there a minimum age requirement? Do we see a variety of ages? We, like that? it seems to be adults. It's not yes. until the 19th century that, that children are accepted at okay. the hospital. I wish that we knew more, more about, about individual patients. We have some names. We, we definitely have right. names and of people that are being treated, but beyond a name and the treatment that they're being given or the clothes that are being purchased specifically for them, there's, there's very, very little information that survives. And, and again, I keep thinking one day somebody's gonna find something amazing. And that's, that's something that happens by the time they get to the 19th century, that court of directors requires more information to be taken right. on each and every patient. Um, and then they can start, start watching how, how those things right. take right. place. And I think one of the interesting things as a you know, 21st century individual, you know, as a historian uh, that we kind of constantly come up against is our modern preoccupation mm -hmm. with statistics. Yep, uh, right. I know for everyone watching out there, today we're so used to just being able to say, I wonder what percentage of people Right. you know, fall mm -hmm. into this category right. and we can find the answer. In the 18th century, they are not nearly as preoccupied no. with statistics as we are. So there are some of those questions that we either have to reverse engineer or just we'll never know. Right. So we want to answer them as well as we can. Sometimes it's, uh, we're still looking. I was going to say, unfortunately, the records don't survive the way we would want them to. Mm -hmm. So we have to start looking at records from the store down the street that might have sold to the public hospital or the notes from James Galt asking the directors for more money for something or that kind of thing, but you sort of have to suss out all the different avenues for that. It's a giant puzzle to put right, together. Right, exactly, <laughs> yeah. exactly. Now, that being said, acknowledging how unfair it is for me to ask you questions about statistics, <laughs> I have a question about statistics, um, <laughs> but it's a really good question. Uh, Tara is asking about the ratio of male and female patients being treated here. Mm -hmm. And following it up, I also want to bring this up um, because Tara says they know women were often committed due to suffering from hysteria. Mm -hmm. So are we seeing that in the 18th century, or at least are we seeing it appear in these records at all? Right. Not in records here. Right. Hysteria definitely pops up in records back in England, but it's important to recognize we're looking at the 1700s and we're over here in the 21st century. Between us and the 1700s is the Victorian time period. <laughs> and that's when you have this idea of, I can take family members that I don't like and put them in a mental institution. I can take women who are suffering from hysteria and put them in an asylum. And I think that's the difference from, from the 18th century to today, is we've got that chunk of time called the Victorian period in between us in the 1700s. I will say one of the, the first patients that was, that was admitted to the public hospital was a woman, but again, we don't know why she was, we don't know why she was admitted. But yes, it does seem like both men and women were part right. of mm -hmm. being Excellent. admitted. Cool. Well, thank you for asking that, Tara. Again, yeah. Sorry yes. to no, give no, that's good. a statistics no, question, that's, that's but I thought, I thought it was yeah. really mm -hmm. interesting. Um, so, uh, this is kind of another statistics question, but you already have the answer. Uh, <laughs> uh, earlier, you mentioned uh, about the number of patients that were seen in a year. You said there were 36 mm -hmm. patients, um, and we were able right. to know from the record right. how many maintained, how many were able to return home, quite a lot of them. Mm -hmm. But you mentioned that nine of them died. Mm -hmm. That's a quarter of the patients that were cared for in a year. And Donna has asked, why was there such a high death rate among the patients that were admitted. Do we know that or have any guesses? I think there's a pretty high death rate among people in Virginia in the 18th century. I mean, I think, you know, there, there's, there's that that you can put out there. Um, we also don't know what their condition was, was when, when they, they arrived. Were, right. That's a great question for that particular quote from 1787 because the hospital had been closed for four years so amazingly, the hospital survives the revolution, but after the revolution, they move the, the, during the revolution, they move the capital to Richmond, and then everybody kind of follows the capital to Richmond. Mm -hmm. 
and they kind of forget about the hospital here. So after the revolution, the hospital closes for four years. And my question would be, what's the condition of the patients that finally make it back to back the hospital, to hospital. Yeah. after the hospital's been closed for four years? Right. And that's something we don't, we don't know. Right. What was the age of the patient? when they arrived. So that's a right. great question. It's definitely yeah. <laughs> on my list of, I wish I knew what the answer to this was. <laughs> so. uh, I have a question coming in from Janet, a little bit different than what we've been talking about, but still very fascinating, I think, um, about how the building is oriented itself. So talking mm -hmm. about what happens in the building, what about outside of the building? Janet wants to know, was the open space in front of the building used in any way or is it just for separation from the world? The public hospital, which we couldn't see in the earlier video, um, is w a major brick building, which you did see. But then we look at the rest of the town and we find there's a major brick building at one end, that's the college, and at the other end is the Capitol, and then we have the palace. But the public hospital is kind of off to the side of the town and back a couple streets from that main street. Um, and that front lawn was meant to that separation. And when they first um, were thinking about building it, they did require that the whole block there be fenced off. So um, they are looking at that separation from the town. Interesting. That's, and if you come and visit in person too, I think like you said, right. viewing it You'll from the see street, that. yeah, it's yes. really interesting to see that yeah. in person. And I think by the time we hit that Frenchman's map in 1781, there is a fence around the entire property. Right, I think yeah. that, and then it's those exercise yards come a little bit later, yeah. and um, it's unclear whether that's because the larger fences have been taken down because the public hospital does eventually expand several more buildings are built sure. on it as we get into the 19th century. Right. Good point too. And the, the library, uh, the Rockefeller Library here at Colonial Williamsburg just had a, a really interesting post they did, about yeah. the public hospital and included um, photos kind of throughout its history. Yeah. And if you look that up online, right. you can get an idea how they eventually use the rest of that property to expand. Because they filled it for a while. Yeah, they really yeah. expanded out into the entire property. And by we the can end uh, get that, the link to it posted. Oh, good. Uh, oh, yeah, that would be great. Yeah, yeah. See it. yeah, yeah that would sure. be good. Yeah. Uh, any, any blog post we mentioned, we'll be able to get up. Good. Now, we are starting to run really low on time, but there are a few questions that are really good that I, okay. I want to squeeze in. So kind of speed round. Um, but Charlie has written an asking when it comes to personal liberty, who removed the patient of their liberty and who returns them? Is this physician or government? Family, oh, in friends? terms of being cured? Uh, yeah, who, who sends them in and who lets them out? <laughs> that's the court of directors, that's government. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. There is this, the advising physician, but it's, but it's, it's that it's court of directors. Yeah, ultimately Excellent. it's their decision. And as, as a note, that court of directors includes Burgesses, but it in, also includes members of the council, right. members of the governor's yeah, council. Yeah, it's the government. Right, yeah. yeah. So, so both, both houses, yep. <laughs> yep. Interesting, and I think you mentioned earlier too, we do see you know people who can be released to their friends that right. that was provided yes. for. So we right. see individuals in the community helping, but right. being right. government is fascinating. Um, all right. This is getting close to a wrap up question. Erin wants to know, what is the biggest question that you have about the hospital and mental health during 18th century Williamsburg that you would like to find the answer oh, to? I mean, I know we looked at a lot of things. Oh, we just man. say, I don't know, but is there any big gap that everyone should scour their attics looking for the journal that has the hidden answer in it? <laughs> yeah. Like D, all of the above, right. like every question, so many questions. Um, like so many of our, of our viewer listeners today, I would love to know more about patients. That's, that's I would I love to know too. more about those patients yeah. and who they were and what, what, what their, their situation within the Virginia society was, um, how they ended up at the public hospital, what they were suffering with. Um, if they were released, I'd like to know where they went right. and what happened to them later. Yeah. Um, that, that, would be, that would be top on my list. That would is, be my list people. too, is to know more about the individual's and their experience there and what led their family or maybe themselves into that situation mm -hmm. and um, the cure that made them, might allow them to be discharged. Right. I would love to have those answers. So everyone, I know. I would check too. your addicts for those 18th century trunks yeah. with the notebooks that have the hidden answers. Um, 
Unfortunately, we are super close on time. So I'm going to kind of bring us into the 21st century as we wrap up. Nicole had asked us about how long the hospital operates. Ashley asks, you know, when it closes. Um, but Nicole's question also asks not just how long the hospital operates, but any major changes that you know, we see uh, while it operates. And I said this brings wow. us into the 21st century because I think this is a pretty cool answer. You guys want to tell us about what happens to the hospital? It's, oh. it's <laughs> I, I, I think back of Francis Falkir in 1766, and I wish that he knew that that, that idea that legacy that he put out there is something that, that we as Virginians have access to mental health care today because the public hospital becomes Eastern State Asylum, goes through a couple of other names and mm -hmm. becomes Eastern State Hospital. hospital. It, is, it is still in operation today. It is still providing mental health care to those of us who live in Virginia today. And what an amazing thing that yeah. he left behind from this, this little idea that he throws into the end of this welcome address to the House of Burgesses. And I wish that he knew that that, that was the legacy that he left us here in Virginia. And it That's was hard throughout those years because we have a couple wars, the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, and you have the ups and downs of the economy and the fact that you know it's hard to keep up a facility because eventually they have as many as 400 and some patients mm -hmm. at one time. That's a lot of buildings, a lot of staff. And so the fact that it can survive these up and down is amazing. They have a fire. Yeah, well, they <laughs> had the fire. There's a fire. It down. That's incredible that it persists right. and we still yeah. see it mm -hmm. today. Now, unfortunately, I tried to squeeze in as many questions as we could, but I have to admit it, we are out of time. So to wrap us up, what is the one thing you each want our viewers to take away from our conversation today? What's the, the one thing you want to make sure they know and think about? Um, something that I always think about when I think about patients is how well cared for they were. And when you look at account books, you know that they are buying shoes and stockings and linen for shirts and shifts and for sheeting. So we know that they have what they need to clothe themselves and keep themselves warm and, and provided for. We know there's a long list of food that's being purchased. Dr. Sequera provides us with that menu of what people are eating. And, and then you wonder about the care in terms not just of medicinals and treatments, but how well cared for were these patients. So in um, 1787, there's a draft for James Galt, the keeper, for just under 48 pounds. When the hospital had closed, he took two patients home and cared for them at home. He knew they didn't have a place to go. He didn't want to send them back out into society. He knew that they would become homeless. So instead of just letting them go to the wind, he keeps them at home and cares for them. And although it's not the way that we might care for a patient today, it was the best amount of care that he could give in the 18th century. And I think that's, that's a, a, a lovely thing to remember about what's happening at the public hospital. That's incredible. And to go along with that, I, it, it is amazing that their people are putting a lot of effort into this. When you think about the size of the town being fairly small, only about 2,000 people, and this large building being built to house over 20, uh, at 24 if it's full, but it's only housing a few, but yet the people who are caring for them, the doctors, the keepers, they are putting effort into it and you realize when you see the records that they're not always being paid on time or you know it can be a year or more before they have to go to the directors and say you know my salary it'd be nice to have that but they're still working at it and caring for the people and it's interesting to think about this whole situation the fact that there is this interest in helping people get through this. That's so wonderful to know that yeah. what we still have today right. starts from a legacy of right. caring genuinely right. about the patients. That's wonderful. Yeah. 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 Well, unfortunately, that is all the time we have for our conversation today, but I need to thank you both so oh, much. Well, thank you. Oh, thank this you. was phenomenal. Your knowledge, your insights are just incredible and it's, it's been a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank and you. thank you also to all of you yes. uh, who watched and listened, who joined in on the conversation and for sending us so many great questions. 
This program today was made possible by generous gifts from our donors, mm -hmm. and it is only because of your financial contributions that we can share the complete and engaging story of our nation. You make it possible for the future to learn from the past. We are so glad that you took the time to join us today, and we really hope that you'll visit us soon in person at Colonial Williamsburg. Mm -hmm. Have a wonderful afternoon.